The philosopher that we're going over today is Nietzsche, and it begins on page 594, where I'm just going to read some of the notes, some of the explanation from the editor of our textbook. And this is at the top of page 594. He says, according to Nietzsche, religion and morality amount to ways of denying what is actually happening. They amount to saying no to life in all of its tragic complexity. Religion and morality ex are expressions of a deep dissatisfaction with, with life as it actually is. So well, with what we're going to see with uh, Nietzsche is any type of rational explanation of the reality of life is actually denying the reality. So what he says attempts to do this are especially religion and morality, but also science. Okay, so but you have to we have to remember what we're starting with here. Okay. We just went over a lot of the modern philosophers. We went over David Hume and Kant and Rene Descartes, and there's a lot of others that we didn't go through. Okay, that's the starting point. So what you have already are popular philosophies, a popular philosophy and way of thinking that is denying because Kant, Immanuel Kant provided an explanation. Remember, he was trying to counter David Hume because David Hume was saying, hey, we really can't know anything. So Kant was trying to answer that and saying, yes, we can know things. Because being a good Christian and a scientist requires that you can say that you know something. That you know, not just know something, but that you know things for certain. Okay, so with Kant... He, he was trying to give that philosophy that was showing that, hey, we could do science, we could do, we can have our religions and all this stuff, and there's certain things that we can know for certain. But what was left over with Kant, which was what people recognize, is that Kant ultimately didn't, does not differ too much from Rene Descartes, and that he still cannot claim that he knows the things in front of his face like you know your hand or your ring or the board right here he still cannot claim that he knows those things with absolute certainty okay so so Nietzsche is in this mode although Nietzsche doesn't say it Nietzsche too has accepted the hyperbolic doubt of Rene Descartes Okay, that is one characteristic that is with all of the modern philosophers that we're going to go over is whether they say it or not, they have assumed it. They have implicitly accepted it. Some of them have explicitly accepted it. Accepted what? The hyperbolic doubt of Rene Descartes. So there's no difference with Nietzsche. Okay, so Nietzsche is going to draw all this modern philosophy to its logical conclusion. And what he's going to say is what I just said, right? What he's going to say is that one of his themes of his philosophy is that, you know, life is tragic. Okay, you, you can work all your whole, you, you will. If you get to live long, you're going to work your whole life. You're in school right now. You're going to do the right thing. You're gonna, you're gonna take care of your kids. You're gonna get a good job. You're gonna, you're gonna work eight, ten hours a day. You know, you're gonna try to do the right thing. You may mess up every now and then, but you're gonna get back on your feet and you're gonna keep pl plowing ahead. But then ultimately, it's it's gonna end for you. It's gonna end for me. Okay, it's, we're gonna either going to die in some tragic accident. Or, or, or even if we live to old age, it's still going to be a tragedy when we die. Because look at you know the sadness that's going to happen when we die. All the, all the things that you acquire that you know and you acquire throughout your life. 
uh, it's building up, isn't it? Like you're in school, you think that you're making progress in learning. Finally, when the end comes, poof, it's gone in an instant. All that learning, all that stuff that's built up in your mind, it's gone. What's the point? Listen, Nietzsche is saying life is a tragic story. A tragedy, and he's referring to like this Greek, this idea of Greek tragedy. This idea of, you know, you have a character, the hero, the moral character, trying to do the right thing, falling, getting back up, but in the end, it's all the efforts are ultimately uh, of no avail. They are ultimately unable to conquer. So with us. Ultimately, no matter who you are, how long you live, you will be unable to conquer in the end because you're going to die. All right? That's the ultimate tragedy. All right? So Nietzsche wants to embrace this. Instead of trying to cover it up with fairy tale stories like in religion and even just with morality in general, because he, he's even saying that re, re, morality, just trying to build a system of morality, is saying no to life. And it's just covering up this, this tragedy, this reality of life. This is why, he, why uh, the editor says at the top of page 595, this is the editor, this isn't Nietzsche. He says, religion and morality are expressions of a deep dissatisfaction with life as it actually is. And he says, Nietzsche wanted to be able to affirm life even in the midst of absurd suffering. And so in this writing of his called The Birth of Tragedy, that's what he's going to look to because he was a scholar of the ancient Greeks. And so he's looking to the ancient Greeks. He's like, hey, they did it pretty good. Of course, he's not talking about Aristotle and Plato. He's talking about these writers in ancient Greece that did like dramas and plays and stuff like this. Because the Greeks did a lot of things pretty extraordinary. Not only philosophy and math, but also uh, these plays of drama and comedy. Here's Nietzsche on the bottom of page 594. What if the Greeks in the very wealth of their youth had the will to be tragic and were pessimists? What if it was madness itself, to use a word of Plato's, which brought the great greatest blessings upon Hellas? Hellas is Greece. And what if, on the other hand, and conversely, at the very time of their disillusion and weakness, the Greeks became always more optimistic, more superficial, more histrionic, and also more ardent for logic and the logicizing of the world, consequently at the same time more cheerful, and more scientific uh, AI, despite all modern ideas and prejudices. And then he goes on. Okay. One of the things that you know, from this reading that, that Nietzsche is starting to, to, to get into to explain is these Greek writers, not Plato, not Aristotle, but the other ones who wrote about tragedy, because the Greeks are also known for these plays of tragedy. See, the Greeks, especially these writers and the people who used to go to their plays and read them, and they're embracing the tragedy. Okay? Why not embrace it? Celebrate it. It's there. It's not going to go away. When you try to moralize and you, you try to explain the tragedy with morals and religion, you're just covering it up. All right, so this is what he's, he's, uh, he's saying. Uh, what if they would have tried to explain it logically, these writers, and, and scientifically? Then they would have ruined it, right? They wouldn't embrace the experience. So, what Nietzsche is going to look to, for Nietzsche, uh, the greatest uh, type of profession concerning, um, I don't even want to say intellectual, but 
and let's put it this way. Uh, the artist is more revered to Nietzsche than the scientist, the philosopher, or anybody else, or the moral leader, the artist. Because think about it, an artist gives expression. There's no trying to explain something away. There's just the expression. I mean, there's the, there is the, just the presentation of their reality. And one of the people that he looked up to was a Wagner, who was known for operas. And so Nietzsche, let me just read this. This is from the editor at the bottom of page 594. He says, Nietzsche hoped that something like the Greek tragic and Dionysian conception of art would be recovered in the musical drama, dramas of his contemporary Richard Wagner. And so he was thinking this it, Wagner, who was a great person there writing operas and stuff, he was thinking like, oh, you know what, the Greek type of thinking is going to come back. And of course, when he's saying Greek, he just means like a certain pe certain perspective in Greece. Because Greece had a lot of different perspectives. Okay? So he's thinking Wagner is going to bring back this, this Greek idea of tragedy. Just embracing it. Right? And so, on page 595, uh, of course, that was to no avail because Wagner eventually disappointed uh, uh, Nietzsche. Um, on page 595, he's going to go over and he's going to explain what I just explained is that art is, well, look at the top caption. Art is closer to reality than morality. So expressions of art, the expressions that come from the artist, paintings, music, things like this, it's more closer to reality than something you would get from explanations of morality or even science. Of course, this is Nietzsche. Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas in the old view would be saying they're all expressions of reality. They all show a different part of reality because reality is huge. But for Nietzsche, reality is really narrow apparently. Okay, And this is, happens for all the modern philosophers because they reject the idea that people know. Like for Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, there's too much to know. I mean... Look in the room you're in right now. How many, have you investigated like every part of your room? Like under the carpet, the ceiling? I mean, look how much stuff there is to know, even in the room you're in. Or let alone outside. But for the modern philosophers, what you can know is very limited. Because they've limited our idea that, with this hyperbolic doubt that, that human beings can really know. So knowing something for the moderns is always a limiting process. You can only know this. You can only know that. Whereas for Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, there's so much to know. There's too much to know. You'll never know it all. Right? So Nietzsche on, on page 595 is saying, Art is closer to reality uh, than morality. I'm just going to read a section here. <clears throat> a little above the middle. He says, this is Nietzsche now. Indeed, the entire book recognize, recognizes only an artist. Through, thought and artist after thought, behind all occurrences, a God, if you will, but certainly only an altogether thoughtless and unmoral artist, God, who in construction, as in destruction, is in good as in evil, desires to become conscious of his own equable joy and sovereign glory, who in creating worlds frees himself from the anguish of fullness and overfulness from the suffering and the contradictions con concentrated within him so what nietzsche is uh going on to say listen nietzsche is not a big fan of god okay so in this explanation on 595 that didn't get a real good that that passage didn't give you an overall view of what the whole what the whole page and his whole view is like the artist is above all of these systems of morality and religion, okay? Especially when we start thinking about God, okay? So, and especially with one religion in particular, and that's Christianity. 
So Nietzsche spends a lot of time countering Christianity. So when he's talking about God, he's usually thinking of the Christian God. You look on the bottom of page 595, he says, From the very first, Christianity was essentially and thoroughly the nausea and surfeit of life for life, which only disguised, concealed, and decked itself out under the belief in another or better life. The hatred of the world, the curse of the affections, the fear of beauty and sensuality, another world invented for the purpose of slandering the world, the slandering this world. So what? Christianity starts talking about another world. What? Heaven and hell. There's another world out there. And he's saying they invent this other world in order to talk bad about this world. They're denying the reality in front of them. Christians are. You got this world, and you're thinking about another make-believe world, right? And for him, Nietzsche, it's just Christians are saying no to life, right? People want to do things. People want to go, you know, get drunk, uh, have all this, you know, sec re sexual relations with many different people. They want to do all these things. But Christians, the Christian morality is always saying no. Right, so you could take that where you want to take it. I mean, uh, according to, to what Nietzsche is saying, I mean, okay, yeah, they are saying no to so. Uh, so what things aren't they saying no to? Okay, that Nietzsche would be in favor of. Okay, look at Nietzsche is, yeah. Some people have tried to save Nietzsche a little, like that he's not really. Uh, giving a loose morality, but Nietzsche's, when you read it, Nietzsche's morality is, is very, in fact, it's non-existent, Nietzsche's morality, okay? It's especially when he talks about Christianity saying no to life, because Christianity says no to, you know, like adultery, but they also say no to like bank robbery and like stealing and things like this, All right? So is that included here? So, uh, for Nietzsche, the main point here is this. For Nietzsche, systems of morality, religion, they're saying no to life. Life is tragic. We have to accept it. And it's best that we embrace it and we try to express ourselves through, through art and, and things in that nature in order to capture what reality really is. When we do science, we try to reason too much and all this stuff, it just covers it up. Okay, and so Nietzsche is going to go further. We're going to skip a bit, and we're going to go to page 604. On page 604, um, there's this story of the mat, the most fam one of the most famous passages from from Nietzsche's writings. The Madman on page 604. Here's Nietzsche. Have you ever heard of the Madman who, on a bright morning, lighted a lantern and ran to the marketplace calling out unceasingly i seek god i seek god as there were many people standing about who did not believe in god he caused a great deal of amusement so this madman he's making up this story right there's this madman goes in the marketplace i see god i see god but most of the people there didn't believe in god why is he lost said one has he strayed away like a child said another or does he keep himself hidden is he afraid of us? Has he t taken a sea voyage? Has he emigrated? The people cried out. So the people are laughing at the guy. The guy's saying, I see God, I see God. But all these rational people in the marketplace are like, well, we don't believe in God. What are you looking for? Is he like under the table? What, is he buying some fruit? The people cried out laughingly, all in a hubbub. The insane man jumped into the mist and tran transfixed them with his glances. Where is God gone? He called out. I mean to tell you, we have killed him, you and I. We are all his murderers, but how have we done it? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the whole horizon? So this madman goes in the marketplace. Where's God at? Where's God at? Everybody's like, what do you mean? Maybe he's under the table, you know? He's like, they don't believe in God. And so the madman is saying, what do we do with them? 
But how did this happen? How did we get rid of God? How is he, how is he, 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 how did, how did we erase him? He's so huge. It's so enormous, the idea of God and Christianity in particular. How did we get rid of all this stuff? What happened? What caused, in other words, what caused people just to not believe in God in general? The eight, like Nietzsche didn't live that long ago. Okay. But the time that Nietzsche is living, he already sees the trend. Okay. And it, and ever since Nietzsche, the, the, his viewpoint is just played out in the modern age. So we're living in a pretty much, in pretty much the same type of modern age as Nietzsche was in. In fact, even more so. So what Nietzsche was thinking and writing about here is even more true today. What's this madman saying? Where's, what happened to God? We killed him. What does he mean that this madman talking about? We killed God. People don't believe in God anymore. In general, people don't believe in the idea of spiritual, of the immortal soul, of God, heaven and hell. People don't believe in that stuff definitely as much as they used to. Especially in like the medieval time, middle ages, or listen, even from our, the age we're living right now to 100 years ago. 50 years ago. I mean, you always hear statistics of how, how um, less field the churches are than what they used to be. I mean, even from 50 years ago, let alone from Nietzsche's time. So what happened? Well, we got part of what happened. We've been going through the part of the story of what happened. Hyperbolic doubt. Extreme skepticism. Nietzsche knows this too. With Descartes, when Descartes presented this hyperbolic doubt, the philosophy is so strong. It is. It has infected just about every area of study. Okay. Which you, you, you really have to understand what the hyperbolic doubt and the extreme skepticism is. It is a doubt that you can know even, even simple things. Even things right in front of your face. Like your book. Or the person next to you. So if you can't know like the book is in front of your face or a marker is in front of your face... Or some of this other stuff. I mean, how would you even, how would you know that God exists? Or that your soul is immortal, heaven and hell and all this other stuff. If you can't know these, these just apparently immediately self-evident truths. So who has killed them? We killed them. We killed them. We don't believe in that stuff anymore. This is the age of reason. Right? So that story of the madman is, is worth a reading over, okay? Because Nietzsche is playing it out. We don't believe in God anymore. What happened that we don't believe in God anymore? It's not that apparent. How did this come about from people who used to believe in God a long time ago? Not just God, but God, God but everything that is, comes with it. People and we'll, that we're going to go through in a minute. People don't believe in God anymore as much as he used to. So what happened? What's going on here? What happened? It's because it's not that apparent of how this change occurred. But I'm telling you, uh, a large cause of this change has to do with the philosophers. From Descartes on. So we see... Now, ever since the hyperbolic doubt of Descartes, because Descartes was a great mathematician. <clears throat> and after him, there's a bunch of great scientists in what's known as the Enlightenment. We got Isaac Newton and a bunch of Einstein. He wasn't in the Enlightenment, but he's another great scientist. 
that people want to look to and say, yeah, those, I mean, think about it today. If you turn on the radio or you, who is giving the advice that is supposed to be, you could take it to the bank. Like if you want to know something, who do you go to? You go to the scientists, right? They're the ones giving the true advice, not the religious person. Like if you go to like the religious person, then, then this is, I'm, I'm saying in general, the general attitude of people is the religious person. It's just all faith. There's no reasoning going on there. You just have to take it on faith. Like you would believe in the Easter bunny or something like this. But if you want to know things for sure, you go to the doctor, medical doctor, you go to the physicist, the scientists, there you get real knowledge. Okay. So the hyperbolic doubt of Rene Descartes, it led to a way of thinking where the only real knowledge comes from scientific method, mathematics. Okay. But even that, even that is, cannot be backed up if there is such thing as hyperbolic doubt. Nietzsche knows this. If we look on page 605, because a lot of people, even at his time, although they discarded religious belief and belief in, in uh, Christianity and things like this, they were saying, you know what? We do have hope for the future. Our hope is in science. But he, Nietzsche is going to show that this is a false hope. On page 605, Nietzsche says, It is always a metaphysical belief on which our belief in science rests. And that even we knowing ones of today, look, and then he goes on. But I'm just going to read that first sentence again. It is always a metaphysical belief on which our belief in science rests. A metaphysical belief. Now, metaphysics, metaphysical beliefs are beliefs that are beyond the physical, metaphysical, beyond the physical, okay? There's different levels of even metaphysical knowledge, okay? When we went over Aristotle and we were talking about those terms that were hard to understand, Right, we were talking about like species, and we even talked about uh, actual and potential. Remember this? Actual and potential. Now, look at the word actual. Is that a physical thing that you could see right now? Is that like saying marker? Like, here's a marker. But can you do that with actual? Is there any actual like on the counter or anything or any potential like on the counter? No, these terms are very metaphysical. Okay, metaphysical. Here's some more metaphysical terms I'm going to give you right now. Now these are really metaphysical soul if we're talking about the soul that plato talked about the soul of christianity that christianity talks about the soul is an immortal immaterial substance that's really metaphysical because that is totally <coughs> excuse me that is beyond the physical all right that's way beyond the physical and then we have god God's way beyond the physical too. That's the ultimate metaphysical substance right there. Immaterial substance. These here are all metaphysical terms. Notice how different they are than marker or ring or phone. Right? You can actually point to a phone. It's a physical thing. But even with a phone, the term itself represents a concept that's not physical. So even, I'm just going to say this, hopefully this isn't too confusing. Even every, every concept that you have, every word that you say, 
that represents something. Okay. Every concept in your mind is they're all metaphysical. Okay. There's just different levels of metaphysics. Some of the concepts that you have in your mind, even though those, those are immaterial, they still point to physical things. Okay. But these don't. This one right here, soul, if the soul is immortal and immaterial, it's totally metaphysical, beyond the physical, as well as this one right here, especially God. So, these two right here, these two terms right here are absolutely essential if you want to do physics. We could put more up here. I'm just using this as an example. Let me get rid of these two. Let's just deal with actual and potential. These two terms are necessary. Either these two terms right here as they are, or another word that means the same thing as these two. They're absolutely necessary if you're gonna do any type of science. If you're gonna do any type of physics. This is what Nietzsche is talking about. When you do physical science, mathematics, physics, biology, you're always using metaphysical terms. Now, if you remember, what are the terms that a certain philosopher said are the least known? Remember David Hume. Remember David Hume said, Metaphysical terms like this, the ones where you can't immediately, you can't find the sense impression, those are the least known. So Nietzsche is just taking it to the conclusion here. Nietzsche is saying, listen, some of you people out there, you want to say that science is your savior now. You don't believe in God anymore. You don't believe in Christianity. But science is no savior. You can't really know that stuff either. Why? Because you use terms like these in science all the time. There's a bunch of them. They're all over the place when you do physics. If you ever took a physics class, there's metaphysical terms flying all over the place. Especially these right here. These are metaphysical terms right here. You can't know these things. So you people who do science, this is what Nietzsche is saying, you people who do science, you're in the same boat as the religious people. You're still believing in uh, stuff that you don't know. This is why you got to embrace just the tragedy of life here. Let's look to the Greeks for answers. Let's look to those ancient Greeks and, and the artists. That's all we can do. Don't try to use your reasoning and logic. So that line's very important on page 605. Nietzsche even goes on to... <clears throat> Here's from the editor of the book. Right below on page 605, the editor says, he's explaining Nietzsche, but he says something very important. Nietzsche seems to be suggesting that the belief in truth is itself outmoded. There is no fixed truth, not even in science. The belief that there is truth is a leftover from belief in God. The two go together. Remember, God... Look, for Christians, God is truth. Right? And what about truth? Here you go. Metaphysical? Do they sell truth on, uh, on a shelf at Walmart? No. This is totally metaphysical right here. So what? So you can't know it. There is no truth. Now, aside from the obvious contradiction here, uh, the obvious contradiction is that if there is no truth, then what the heck is Nietzsche telling us? Then why does he keep talking? He, I suppose he's trying to tell us that the best thing to do is to look to Greek tragedy and, and just embrace this absurdity of life. Does he think that's true? Okay, so aside from the ultimate contradiction of what he's writing about, let's ignore that. 
And let's just focus in on the idea that truth is a metaphysical concept that is not known by us. So there's no truth. We can't know. Listen, when you say you can't know something, it's this it's pretty much the same as saying it doesn't exist. Although there is a distinction there. But it, it's I mean, if you act like nothing something's not known to you, it's pretty much, you know, it's like it's not there. Like if you don't know a certain law exists and you can't naturally know it because it was some law that somebody put in place that you wouldn't naturally know, don't you walk around like it pretty much doesn't exist? Yeah, so if something's not known to you, it's like it doesn't exist. You can't know truth. It's like it doesn't exist. So Nietzsche, you know, you got to admire Nietzsche. Because there's a lot of people today who want to throw out all of the traditions in all of even the religion. I mean, not just from Christianity, but some of the stuff that that uh, Islam has contributed to to society. Some of the things that Judaism has contributed to society. Some of the things that that Christianity, especially Christianity, has contributed to society. They want to just throw everything away. Without, or th they want to throw the basis of those things away, especially Christianity. They want to throw away the fundamentals of those religions, especially Christianity, without really thinking it through. Thinking it through for a second. Okay, so Nietzsche has thought it through. He's saying there's no, listen, no, God's dead. There's no truth. But let's think about it, the, of what that means. On page 604, it's entitled, look at the, oh, excuse me. That's not the right page. The right page is at the top of page, it starts on the ba uh, bottom of page 605. He says the most important of more recent events that God is dead, that the belief in the Christian God has become unworthy of belief, already begins to cast its first shadows over Europe. So even in Nietzsche's time, he's seeing it. He's like, listen, the idea that God is dead, it's already starting to be seen in Europe. To the few at least whose eye, whose suspecting glance is strong enough and subtle enough for this drama. Some sun seems to have set. Some old profound confidence seems to have changed into doubt. Our old world must seem to them daily more darksome. What does he mean by this? The idea that God is dead, in particular the Christian God, has already begun to show itself in Europe, he says. What does it mean that God is dead? Christianity is not true. There's no God. Well, if that's true, what things were built on this idea of the Christian God? Is there anything around today that ultimately got its start and has its principles, as its principles, this Christianity? Nietzsche says in the middle of page 606, because so much was built upon it, it is so, so much rested on it and has become one with it. For example, our entire European morality. Listen, we don't even realize it today. But this idea of, of feeding the homeless, you know, and forgiving your neighbor, being nice, you know, a bunch of different, we can go on forever. All of our morality, listen, we didn't make it up on our own usually. Usually it's passed down to us. Okay, A lot of, even today, with, with uh, um, so many hundred years already of the modern philosophy and the new way of thinking, even today, uh, we still run our lives and our government resting on these old Christian principles. That's why he says our entire European morality. 
has been resting on these Christian principles. This lengthy, vast, and uninterrupted process of crumbling destruction, ruin, and overthrow, which is now imminent, who has realized it sufficiently, sufficiently today to have to stand up as the teacher and herald of, the, of such a tremendous logic of terror as the prophet of a period of gloom and eclipse? Not just the morality. What about yeah, the idea of a university? These are all Christian conceptions. They wanted a universe. God is truth. God is the, so whatever subject or science you go into, God is the author of it. There's order in the universe. So let's start a university uh, with a, in all the different sciences and they can all come together and talk to each other and even talk about greater universal truths. Listen, that's all based on this idea that there's truth and there's a God and the, the universe is orderly. But you don't know those things, according to Nietzsche. What about art? The great art and the principles of art, they had their start with these Christians. And why did they start with these? I mean, you go read them. Go read some of these, these great Christian artists. They're mostly referring to the design of God. The beauty that God has put into the universe, they want to reflect on canvas. Look at this. Architect, architecture. Like the great buildings that were ever made and built. The great architecture of the world. Go read some of these uh, uh, designers who designed all this stuff and what they were thinking and how their mind was Christian oriented and that formed the principles by which uh, they were doing things. Right? And what Nietzsche's point is, look at all this stuff that rests on this idea that God exists. And what he's saying is, listen, if you want to get rid of God, which he wants to do, if you want to get rid of God, don't try to hold on to all this Christian morality. Don't try to hold on to all this uh, Christian architecture. Don't try to hold on to the idea even of a university. Don't try to hold on to all, listen, all, all, most of the institution in our, in our society are based on these Christian type thinking. These principles laid down by Christianity a large part due to St. Thomas Aquinas and his use of Aristotle. I'm talking philosophically speaking, since this is philosophy, a philosophy course. Okay. What ne so what Nietzsche is saying, so music too, though. I mean, look at the great composers and it's very start with Gregorian chant and then the, all the great composers. I mean, look at what they were. Look at what they were writing for. Right. I mean, all this music, I mean, it, uh, most of it had its start in like the Catholic Mass. So what Nietzsche is saying is, if you want to get rid of God, if God is dead, then don't expect to hold on to the other stuff. This is why he says a dark shadow is, has came over Europe. If God is dead, then ultimately... If we get rid of God, all the other stuff will crumble too, eventually. All the Christian art, the principles that come from that will crumble, everything else. So this kind of meshes with his, his presentation that we went through in, this, in the beginning. Uh, Nietzsche wants to revert back to the Greek writers of tragedy as pretty much our our savior at this point. Okay, what we what we ought to be embracing is just the tragedy of life. God is dead. Don't try to hold on to all the stuff that the Christian that are built upon this idea of a Christian God. Nietzsche has a nihilist mindset. 
Okay. Nihilism, the, the root here of nihilism, this Latin word nihil, means nothing. Nietzsche has a nihilistic mindset, like a nothingness mindset. Okay, there's no morality, there's no science, there's no, uh, there's no, I mean, think of all the sciences. Sure, he wants to revert back to, to this Greek tragedy, but really, what's even the point of that? I mean, do we have to? Right? This is a nihilistic mindset. As soon as you embrace the idea that, that human beings can't really know things, it's inevitable that we reach this, this idea of nothingness. Nihilism, for nihilism, you can't really know. So what's if you can't really know something, then how would you ever know you have any purpose to your life? How do you know there's purpose in nature? Is there purpose at all? This is nihilism. So <clears throat> this was on the top of page 60, 606, and that's the furthest we're going to go with Nietzsche.